So I made this, vi I'm going to make this video so that we can um, not be behind um, from me being gone today. Uh, so we're going to pick up with our notes um, with section 7.2, but remember these notes are from the 7th edition book. Um, in the 8th edition book that you're using, it's actually section 7.3 where we talk about confidence intervals for the mean when the sigma is not known. Um, before we get into uh, section uh, 7.3, let me kind of reiterate where we're headed with this. So <clears throat> in um, we have confidence intervals in chapter 7 and we have hypothesis testing in chapter 8. And both of them kind of follow the same pattern. So um, the first section in both in both chapters, so 7-1 and 8-1, are kind of an introduction to confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. And then when we get into 7-2 um, and 8-2, um, the first thing that we look at is we look at confidence intervals or hypothesis testing for the mean, um, and this is like what we did last class, with the sigma known. So you are given and know the population standard deviation. If you're looking at um, a mean for the confidence interval or a mean for the hypothesis test and you know the sigma, then what we do is we use um, either a Z confidence interval or a Z test. Um, this dictates which uh, where we go on the import on the um, table to find our z sub alpha over two value. Okay, and then um, the second thing we do is what we're going to do today is the confidence interval for the mean when the sigma is unknown. So mean with I'm going to change the wording on that. I'm going to say only s known. Okay. So no sigma, which means they won't give us a population standard deviation. They'll give us a sample standard deviation. So it'll only be an S, a sample standard deviation. Very, very similar process, except for we have to use a different um, part of the table because we have to do what's called a T confidence interval or a T test. And we have to adjust for the fact that we're only using the standard deviation for the sample, which isn't going to be quite as strong as having the population standard deviation. But this is actually more realistic because when you're studying a population, rarely do you know the standard deviation of the population um, before you study it. So uh, maybe if it's, a, it's something that's been studied a lot and you're reinvestigating it, but usually you don't know the population standard deviation. Usually you can only use the standard deviation deviation from your sample. Um, then the third thing <coughs> that we'll look at, this will be in 7.4 um, and 8.4, is we're going to look at proportion. So we'll look at a confidence interval proportion um, and we'll look at a hypothesis test for a proportion. When we do proportion, we go back and use that same z values that we used for um, having the sigma known. So we're going to do a Z confidence interval or a Z test. And then the last thing that we're going to do in both sections or in both chapters is we're going to look at either a confidence interval or hypothesis test on an actual variance or a standard deviation. When we do that, we have to use a different table altogether and it's called the chi-squared table. So we're going to do a chi-squared confidence interval or a chi-squared test. Um, and we use a different table than we use with these other three. So let's look at what we have for, um, so it's really, let me stick on this for just a second more. Um, so it's really important when you're looking at a problem to determine first which of these am I on. So what we're doing right now is we're doing um, this one. We know we're going to be talking about means and we're going to only know the S, so it's going to be a mean, we're only going to know the S, and so through this whole section we're going to be using the T 
um, confidence interval. Um, I'll un this is for chapter eight. So in chapter seven, um, we're right now we're using doing the mean with only the sigma known. So we're going to be using um, a t confidence interval using the t chart. We won't know the population standard deviation. And it's really important before you start the problem that you know which one you're on. Okay, so um, what this uh, says is that if the value um, of sigma is not known, then we have to estimate it using the sample standard deviation. Um, when we do that, we really um, want it to be a sample that's bigger than 30. Um, that's just kind of a rule of thumb. Uh, but it also says that um, critical values greater than the values for z sub alpha over 2 um, are used in confidence intervals in order to keep the interval at a given level. So we're going to, um, what we're going to do, let me pull the, the formula over here, or the formula chart. Okay, so we're still going to be using this same chart that we used before. But if you remember when we were doing the Z testing, we took um, whatever the confidence level was and we went all the way to the bottom of the chart. And at the bottom row of the chart, it actually labels it as Z. And it says that the sample size here is infinite. It's not necessarily infinite, but it's very large. It's the whole population. So if we were doing a Z, we could just go all the way to the bottom and use these values. Okay, so if it was a 80% confidence interval and we knew sigma, we would come all the way down here and use 1.28. Remember, we rounded two decimal spots. Um, so they wrote them with three up here, but we actually want to write them with two. So 1.28, 1.65, 1.96, 2.33, and 2.58. But now what we're going to do is we're going to adjust for the sample size, be, or the, um, yeah, the sample size. Because we're using the standard deviation from the sample, the bigger the sample, the better. Um, the smaller the sample, the worse. So it, we talked the other day, what do you do if you have, um, you want more confidence um, or you have a, uh, a higher standard deviation, um, then you end up where you're going to be casting a bigger net. So what happens, because we aren't as, we aren't as, um, we don't have as, solid of a standard deviation when we're just using the standard deviation from the sample. Um, the smaller the sample gets, the bigger these numbers get. You notice that these numbers just keep getting bigger and bigger. So we could be at 98%, but if our sample is really small, we could be using um, a number around 3, whereas if it was a Z, if we knew the population standard deviation, we'd only be using 2.33. And so what that does in our formula is it makes our, um, how much we add and subtract much bigger. So our confidence interval gets wider. Uh, so what we want to make our net, our, our confidence interval smaller is we want to, we want to have as big a sample as we can. Um, and we also, if you want to make the net smaller, you can look at uh, less percentage on your confidence intervals. Because if you want to be really confident, then you have to widen out your net to be more confident that you'll catch the the actual mean in there. Okay, so let's actually do some because I think it makes a whole lot more sense when you see one in action. Um, the values that we're going to get off of that table um, are called the, um, that's called the student T distribution or the T distribution. Kind of a funny story, the person that um, developed this, when he developed it, he worked for a company and he had a clause in his contract that said that he couldn't publish things under his own name because he was kind of um, an entity or he was getting um, a lot of his uh, means to be able to do his research and stuff from working for the company. And so when he published it, he couldn't publish it under his name and so he published it as Student T. Um, later years he was actually given um, credit for it but it never it never changed to his actual name. It always just ended up being called the T distribution. Um, and because of that I can't even remember the guy's name right now. Um, so anyway, let's look at our next slide. So the T distribution is very similar to the, the standard normal distribution that we use um, for the other when we know the sigma, the Z distribution. Um, it's still bell-shaped. It's still symmetric about the mean. It still has the mean, median, and mode are equal. Um, and the curve still never touches the x-axis. 
But with the T distribution, we have a few things that are different. Um, it has a variance that's greater than one. So with our regular standardized uh, normal distribution, um, our variance um, is one. Um, but it's larger than that with the T distribution. And the biggest thing is, is um, that you need to remember is that you, it's actually a family of curves. So we have different numbers to base, based on what the sample size is. And these different values that we're going to use are, called, are based on what's called the degrees of freedom which is related to the sample size. In fact, it's very related to the sample size. Degrees of freedom is equal to the sample size minus one. And as the sample size increases, the T distribution gets closer and closer to the normal distribution. So again, on that table, you notice as we got closer to the bottom of the table, because the sample was getting bigger, we were getting closer to those bottom row values. So the bigger the sample, the closer you get to um, what we had before. Um, which means that our net gets smaller um, because we've got a better sample size. So um, DF is usually used for degrees of freedom. So you'll see the symbol DF. Um, the degrees of freedom for a confidence interval for the mean um, is DF equals N minus 1. It says um, for some statistical tests used later in this book, the degrees of freedom are not n minus 1, but we don't get to any of those. So for our purposes, for this whole, set, whole class, um, our degrees of freedom will always equal n minus 1. And all this shows is that, um, again, if the degrees of freedom are smaller, you're going to end up having a wider curve, which is going to make your, your number bigger and make your net bigger. And the closer or the bigger your degrees of freedom get, so the bigger your sample size gets, the closer you get to our, our old Z curve, which is the black curve here. Again, not something you really have to know um, to do the problems, but it might help you just kind of understand why we have to adjust um, for the sample size. Okay, so moving on. So before we look at um, how to do the formula for the confidence interval when we only know S, um, we're going to first uh, look at how to find the T sub alpha over 2 off the table. So before we had a Z sub alpha over 2, now we have a T sub alpha over 2. Um, and so we're looking here. Um, I'm going to show you on the actual chart. I mean, they have kind of a partial one here, but I'm going to show you on the actual chart. So we're looking for the T sub alpha over 2 value if we have a 95% confidence interval and the sample size is 22. Okay, so again, we've got a 95% confidence interval and we have an N of 22, which means that the degrees of freedom is 21. Degrees of freedom is always one less than the sample size. So when we go to the table, pull the table up here. Hold on, I have it somewhere here. There it is. Um, it is, we're going to look at 95%. And instead of going all the way to the bottom like we did before, we're going to stop at the proper degrees of freedom. So our degrees of freedom are here on the left. So we're going to come down to 21 degrees of freedom. And then we're going to come over. Let me grab a pen here. So we're going to come to our degrees of freedom of 21. We're going to come over and we're going to come down. Remember, we want 95%, it said. And we just come to where they meet each other. So our T sub alpha over 2, not Z sub alpha over 2, because that's way at the bottom, but our T value is 2.080. Okay, so we just adjust for that sample size. Smaller the sample size, the bigger this number gets. I mean, you'll notice if our degrees of freedom is 1, which means we only had a sample size of 2, we have to use 12.706, which is kind of ridiculous. But either way, these still get a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger as we go up. Okay, so smaller sample size, we get bigger values. But this is the value for a T sub alpha over 2 with a 95% confidence level. 
So that's how you look those up on the chart. So here's our new formula for if we're looking at a confidence interval for the mean still. Remember, we're still looking at mean, but the sigma is unknown. In other words, again, we only know the S. Um, you'll notice this formula looks very, very similar to the one we did um, last class. Uh, we still have mean in the middle. We still have a left side that is identical to the right side, except for the fact that it has um, a minus on the left side and a plus on the right side. So we have minus T sub alpha over 2 here, and here we have plus. Um, the other thing is the Z sub alpha over 2 has been replaced with a T sub alpha over 2, because we're going to adjust for that sample size using the degrees of freedom. And then instead of a sigma, we have an S. Other than that, everything is the same. So this isn't really a different process as far as plugging it into the, the formula. It's just a process, a, a different, slightly different process of where you look it up on the table. So let me write, um, let me get the next slide up here. We'll write this formula down and we'll try one. So here's our first example um, of this type. It says a random sample of 10 children found that their average growth for the first year was 9.8 inches. Assume the variable is normally distributed and the sample standard deviation is 0.96 inches. Um, find the 95% confidence interval of the population mean for the growth during the first year. So now if you look up here, we know that we're doing this T confidence interval, be interval because it said the sample standard deviation is 0.96 inches. So we don't have the population standard deviation, we only have the sample. So I'll write this down here. So the S is 0.96. Because we only have the S, that means we have to worry about um, degrees of freedom. And so our N in this case said that it was a sample of 10 children. So we're going to have an N of 10, which means that our degrees of freedom equals 9. Now we have to use both these values. We use the 9 on the chart, but we use 10 in the formula. So we have to kind of know those and try not to mix them up. Um, the next thing that we need is we need our, um, our X bar, our average. And it said that the average was 9.8 inches. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to know what the T value is based on the 95%. So we're going to have to go to the chart to look this up. So if we want 95% with the degrees of freedom 9, Let's look at what that looks like on the chart. So 95% degrees of freedom 9. 95%, we're going to come down this way, degrees of freedom, whoops, I came down a little far, degrees of freedom 9, and we're going to have this value right here. Hold on, let me undo that. Let me be a little bit more accurate on this one so I don't run over um, where we want to be. So we're going to come down 95% and then we're going to come over from the 9. So this is the value that we're going to use. So we'll come back over here and we'll put in that value that we got from the table. Which was 2.262. And then we'll take everything and we'll plug it into the formula up here. So we have uh, 9.8 minus uh, 2.262. And then our S is 0.96. And our N is 10. Be careful not to use the degrees of freedom there. That's less than the mean. And then 9 point, this is larger than 9.8 plus 2.626 times 0.96 over square root of 10. Um, I'll calculate the uh, margin of error first on each side and I will get um, point 
0.69 and um, they've used one decimal past the what the average was and so 9.8 plus 0.69 on the other side and if we subtract and add that we get 9.11 is less than the mean is less than 10.49 so we can be 95 percent confident that the actual um, height on average that a child grows in the first year is somewhere between 9.11 inches and 10.49 inches. Now that doesn't mean all babies will be between those measurements. It means the average of all the babies is somewhere between those two measurements. So our next example um, gives us information in raw data. You won't run across that on your homework at all. Um, in the homework, it'll give you the um, <clears throat> the mean and the uh, the sample standard deviation uh, within the paragraph. So we'll just uh, look at it here in the problem. You won't have to calculate that. So this says that the uh, data represent a sample of the number of home fires started by candles for the past several years. Um, it's actually seven years if you count them. Um, find the 99% confidence interval for the mean number of home fires started by candles each year. So the formula is x bar minus uh, t sub alpha over 2 s over square root of n. That's less than the mean. And then larger than the mean would be x bar plus t sub alpha over 2 times s over square root of n. So let's pick out all the things that we have. Um, x bar is uh, given as 7,000, 41.4. I'm going to put it down here because I'm kind of not sure I have room to fit up there. And then we're going to subtract um, t sub alpha over 2 which um, is 3.707 and I'll show you that here in the table in just a second and then the S is 1610.3 um, over the square root of 7 because uh, we were discussing uh, 7 years and then we fill in all the same information on the other side with that plus symbol And we'll go look at the table real quick to see where they got this. Um, the 3.707 was because there was a 99% confidence interval. And because the N was 7, that means that the degrees of freedom is 6. So we're going to go to our table and we're going to look for 99% with degrees of freedom of 6. Okay, so we've got... Um, the row 6 and we're not going to stop at 95% we're going to go all the way over to 99% and uh, you see there that value is 3.707 so that's where they got that from degrees of freedom 6 because the sample size was 7 and then 99% if I calculate the uh, margin of error on this one again that's the part after the plus and minus Then I get that I'm going to add and subtract to 7,041.4, 2,256.2 on each side. And I'm not sure why on this one they didn't go one more decimal spot past the original average. And 
If you subtract that, you get 4,785.2. And then if you add that, you have 9,297.6. And again, that's how many house fires on average there are in a year. And that's a really big um, confidence interval. It goes all the way from below 5,000 to over 9,000. Um, when our confidence intervals get really large, they're not quite as helpful. So what causes this confidence interval to be so big? Well, there's two things. Um, first of all, they wanted to be very accurate. Um, and so be trying to be 99% accurate means that you have to make your net really big in order to be fairly confident that you catch the average in there. So that 99% confidence makes our, our confidence interval larger. And then the other thing is, is you only have a sample of seven. That's a very small sample. So that N of seven um, is pretty small. And when you have a small sample, you have to adjust a lot for that, which again makes the, the width of the confidence interval bigger. So that high confidence level with a small sample, um, that combination gave us a very wide confidence interval. Okay, so now we're going to look at section 7.3 in the notes. But remember, 7.3 um, in the notes is actually 7.4 in your book. Okay, so in the homework assignment, this will be 7.4. And we're going to be looking at confidence intervals and sample size for proportions, first confidence intervals. But the key here is that we're looking at proportions. We're not looking at means anymore. So the things that we looked at, we looked at the mean with sigma, and that was a Z. We used the Z table. Then we looked at the mean with only S, and that's when we had to use the degrees of freedom in the T table. And now that we're back to proportion, um, we're back to the Z table, or not back to proportion, but now that we're doing proportions, that's the Z table. So when we're looking at proportions, um, we're going to be using these values, um, P hat and P, that we, um, I'm sorry, not P hat and P, P hat and Q hat, that um, are kind of similar to what we used in the binomial. Um, the p hat um, is the one here with this uh, little mark on top of it, and um, it stands for the sample proportion. And then the q hat, kind of like we did when we were doing the binomial, the q hat has to be the rest of, of what's in the sample. So if you say 70% of the sample had a certain attribute, then the q would be 30%. Okay, so the sample proportion, and the sample has that little hat on it when you're talking about the actual population proportion. It's just a P, but it's when, it, when, it's, with, when it's the little sample, then we put this cute little hat on it um, to help us remember that that's not the actual population proportion. It's just a sample. And so again, just like we were doing the binomial, say you know p hat is 0.7, then to get q hat, it has to add up to 100% or 1, so our q hat would be 0.3. Um, they'll either give you the information to calculate p hat, or they'll give you p hat, and then you'll get q hat after you have p hat. And the p hat is the amount that is what, you, what you're looking at, the attribute you're looking at. Say you're saying, um, I'm talking, how many people have been to, I ask a bunch of people, how many people have been to a, or you've been to a baseball game? And out of the people, 70% say they've been to a baseball game, then that means 30% haven't been to a baseball game. So in this next problem, um, we're not going to do the whole formula for um, confidence interval for proportion. They're just going to have us do the p hat and the q hat. So it says, um, a random sample of 200 workers found that 128 of them drove to work alone. 
So 128 drove to work alone out of the 200 that they asked. So they don't give us p hat, but they give us enough information to calculate it. So 128 out of 200 um, is our proportion of workers that have the attribute that we want. That comes out to be 0.64. And if p hat is 0.64, then that makes q hat um, equal to 1 minus 0.64. which is 0.36. So 64% of the workers drive to work alone and 36% um, don't drive to work alone. So here's the formula for the proportion for a confidence interval. Um, you'll notice in the middle we have a P instead of an M because, or a mu, because we're talking about proportion. And then the formula is very fairly similar, but instead of having a sample average, we have a sample proportion. Uh, we're going to subtract um, the z sub alpha over 2, which we get off the chart the same as we got before. And then we're going to multiply by the square root of p hat q hat over n. Notice this time in this formula, the, the square root is over the whole thing. And then also notice that the left side and the right side look identical, just like they did before, except the left side has a minus and the uh, right side has a plus. And then this little NP greater than or equal to 5 and NQ greater than or equal to 5 just uh, says that we want in the sample, we want at least 5 that have the attribute and at least 5 that don't have the attribute. So for instance, say you were asking people, have you been to Taiwan? You ask 25 people if they've been to t Taiwan. Um, and I'm going to use 25 because it's easier than 30. So you say 25 people that you asked. And um, out of those 25, one out of the 25 said that they had been to Taiwan. Well, one out of 25... Uh, have been, that means 24 out of the 25 have not been, and 1 out of 25, um, if you divide that, um, it's 0 0.04, or you could think of it as uh, 1 25th is the same as 4 one hundredths, but it's 0 0.04, which leaves Q hat to be 0 0.96, so 0 0.4 would be your P hat, and, 90, and uh, 0 0.96 would be your Q hat. But the problem is, is in that sample, you've only got one that has the attribute you're looking for. That's that doesn't that's not bigger than five. So if I did 0.04 times 25, I get that one person that's been to Taiwan. Well, <clears throat> if I was taking that sample and it just so happened that I had gotten just one more person that had gone to Taiwan, then um, that would double the percentage for P hat. So just adding one more person changes the percentage from 0.04 to 0.08 and lowers our Q hat all the way down to uh, 92%, 0.92, so 23 out of 25. And that's such a change, we don't really want that if your sample was just one different, that it would change the percentages so much. So that's why they say go ahead and pick more until you have at least five in each category. You might end up with four percent, but make sure you pick enough people so that you have um, a good accurate sample. So now um, here's the formula for um, the proportion again, and here's a problem. It says um, a survey conducted by Sally May and Gallup of 1,404 respondents found that 323 students paid for their education by student loans. Find the 90% confidence of the true proportion of students who paid for their education by school loans. So let's fill in what we have. First of all, we know it's this type of problem because it asks for the 90% confidence of the true proportion. So we're not looking at a mean, we're looking at proportion, P. And then we've got 323 students out of 1,404 that uh, took out a student loan. So that's your P hat. So 
So p hat um, comes out to be 323 out of uh, 1,404. which is equal to 0.23. And so that leaves our Q hat to be 1 minus 0.23. So we're saying 23% of the students um, had a student loan, and then the other students, the other 77%, 0.7, did not have student loans. Um, we don't know if they got grants or scholarships or they paid for it on their own, but they did not get student loans. So those 23 got student loans, and these other... 77% did not get student loans. And again, that's 100% minus 23% to get the 0.77 or the 77%. The N is 1,404. That's how many people they surveyed. And the only other thing we need is the Z sub alpha over 2. And we're going to get that by uh, how what the confidence level is. So the confidence level is 90%. We don't have to worry about degrees of freedom or anything because we always do a Z when we're talking about pro proportion. Mean, if it has sigma, you use Z. If it doesn't have sigma, you use T. But proportion, you always use Z. So we'll go to the table here, and it said we wanted... Um, 90%, I'm sorry, 95%, and we're doing a Z, so we go all the way to the bottom and use that 1.96. So Z, is, Z sub alpha over 2 from the chart is uh, 1.96. Then we fill that into the, uh, everything we've got into the formula. We got 0.23 minus 1.96 square root of 0.23 times 0.77 all over 1,404. And then on the other side, we do the same thing, but we add it. So 0.23 plus 0.77. We'll calculate out that margin of error and see what we're going to subtract and add. So I'm just doing this part right here. And I have 0.23. And I'm going to subtract uh, this, which comes out to be 0 0.019. And there the book went one more spot past the decimal again. Um, and then, or past the proportion decimal. And then 0.23 plus. 0.019. If I subtract that and add that, I get 0.211 and 0.249. So we could be 90% confident that we're somewhere between, or that somewhere between 21.1% on average and 24.9% on average of students um, get their money for college. Um, for their education from student loans. We could write it as a percentage if we want. I think Connect Math has you leave it um, as the decimals, the 0 0.211, the 0 0.249. But I think the 21% and the 24.9%, so we're just over 21% and just under 25% of students on average that get their loans from, or get, pay for their education with student loans. So there's their nice pretty picture of it, or nice work for it. And then there's their real formal way of saying it. You can be 90% confident that the percentage of students who pay for their college education by student loans is between 21.1 and 24.9%.
questions. Now let's look at another problem where we're talking about uh, a survey asking about lawn weeds. So on this problem it says that their survey was of uh, 1,898 people. So let me try to be efficient here. That's our N, 1,898 people. Um, in this case, they actually gave us the percentage. They didn't make us calculate it. The, um, found that 45% of the adults said they were the toughest, said dandelions were the toughest weeds. So our P hat is 0.45, um, which of course makes our Q hat 0.55. Because if we've got 45%, we need 55% to get to 100. Um, the only other thing we need at this point then is the, um, the, Z sub alpha over 2, and we're at a 95% confidence level. So 95%, and we're getting a Z value, Z sub alpha over 2. And um, if we go to the chart, we're doing a Z value, and so we're going to go up here to the 95% come all the way to the bottom and we're going to use that 1.96 value. We're going to use these values at the bottom a lot. So 1.96 for that. And then we plug everything in. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and, and use their work here. So we have 0.45 for our um, P hat. That's this right here. Um, minus 1.96 times the square root of p hat and q hat, which is 0.45 and 0.55. Then we're going to divide that by 1,898 because that's the n, and then do the same thing on the other side with the plus. Um, this margin of error part, just this part with the z times the square root part, comes out to be 0.022. So that's how much we're going to subtract, that's how much we're going to add, and we end up with 0.428 is less than the true proportion of the uh, population is less than 0.472. So we are 95% confidence, confident that the percentage of adults who consider dandelions the toughest weeds is somewhere between 92.8% and 97.2%. So we're 95% confident that the average is somewhere between uh, almost 93% and just over 97%. Uh, of people think that the dandelions are the toughest weed to control in their yard. So the last thing we're going to do here in this section is we're going to look at what if you want to know the sample size before you start um, your research study. Before the researcher started their study, what if they wanted to make sure that they were within a certain margin of error? So the the problems are going to be worded different. Instead of asking you to give a confidence interval, it's going to ask you what's the sample size or what sample size is needed to stay within a certain error. And so sample size is n, so we know we're looking for this n, and this is the formula we need. We need the formula for what n equals. We're going to, you're going to be given the p hat and the q hat. Um, you're going to look up the z sub alpha over 2, put in the error that they give, and then you'll know what size sample to do. Now this is a little bit different than the, the one we did before because you have to know the p hat, q hat from like a prior, somebody has to have studied the data already. Um, one thing I want to note is on the homework, if they don't give you p hat and q hat, use 0.5 and 0.5 because that gives you the largest um, multiple of p hat and q hat is 0.5 and 0.5 um, and so if you don't have a prior study you can still do it you just have to use p hat as 0.5 and 0.5 and q hat but in most of the problems they'll give you that they'll say from a prior sample um, this is what happened So our example of this says, a researcher wishes to estimate with 95% confidence the proportion of people who own a home computer. 
A previous study shows that 40% of those interviewed had a computer at home. The researcher wishes to be accurate within 2% of the true proportion. Now, one thing you have to be really careful about, whenever we're doing um, one of these problems, they're going to give you um, the accuracy as a percentage. So they want to be within a certain percentage. So here right there is the, um, the level of error that we want. But remember, almost always when we're dealing with a percentage, you change that percentage to a decimal when you're working with it in the problem. So the error is not 2, it's 0.02. If you put a 2 down here instead of the 0.02, it's going to mess it up a lot because you're, multi you're dividing by something that's 100 times bigger than it's supposed to be. So um, be really you know, careful to change that 2% to a decimal just like you normally would with decimals. <clears throat> We know that p hat is um, 0.4, which makes q hat 0.6 because they have to add to 100 or add to 1 when they're in decimal form. And then all we need um, at that point is the z sub alpha over 2. Well, the um, confidence is 95%, so I forgot to write that down. So knowing that we're at 95%, we'll get the um, z sub alpha over 2 off the chart. And I'm not going to go back and look it up again. Um, it's that same 1.96 that we just looked up twice. So it's 95%, go all the way to the bottom because it's a z, and you get 1.96. So if I plug that into the formula, the sample size should be 0.4 times 0.6 using this formula here, and then I'm going to put in the z of 1.96 and divide it by the error of 0.02, and don't forget to square it. So you just type in your calculator, 0.4 times 0.6 times parentheses, 1.96 divided by 0.2, parentheses, power 2. And you should get an n of about 2,304.96. And remember, with these sample sizes, we always go up because we, this is the minimum sample size that you can have. So even if this came up to be 2,304.06, we would still round it to 2,305 as their sample size. So they want to take a sample of at least 2,305 people if they want their margin of error to stay within 2%. So here's a, just a quick example of what I was talking about. If we didn't have a prior sample, then they would use p hat is 0.5 and q hat is 0.5. Do everything else the same, but we end up having to have more people in our survey because we don't know any information from the prior survey about what the percentages are. Um, so when you do 0.5 times 0.5, that's bigger than any other value. For instance, here, let me just kind of show you. So like if you did... 0.3 times 0.7, that gets you 0.21. If you did 0.4 times 0.6, that gets you 0.24. And then if you do 0.5 times 0.5, you get 0.25. So these are like potential P's and Q's. So if that was the P, that's the Q. If this was the P, that's the Q, and so on. But then once you get past that, if you get on the other side of that, then you start to go down again. So you'd be like 0.6 times 0.4 and you'd be getting smaller values. So this is like the pinnacle. This is like the biggest the p hat times q hat can be. So they say, well, if you don't know it, use the biggest and err on the side of caution and get a little bit bigger sample um, than you need rather than a smaller sample. <coughs> so, the very, so the very last thing that we have to do is confidence intervals um, for variances and standard deviations. Um, in our notes at 7.4, but in your book, it's 7.5. So in your homework, this is homework 7.5. And um, when do we use confidence intervals for variances and standard deviations? Well, one of the biggest things is if you, um, you want to have some sort of um, quality control in a business, um, if you aren't careful about how you manufacture those, um, they won't fit together correctly. Say you have uh, two pipe pieces that need to fit together. They're not going to fit together if one's too big or one or the other one's too small. Um, they're either going to slip or they're not going to go together. Um, something that we all have, I'm sure at some point, had a chance to do um, when you 
buy some piece of furniture from Walmart or Ikea or somewhere and you have to put it together yourself, um, if they haven't had good quality control, the pieces that you need to put together might not line up. So you might have two pieces that are supposed to line up and you're supposed to put some sort of a fastener through them. And if they haven't done a good job of quality control, then that fastener won't fit through because the pieces don't fit together right. So um, you have to really watch your quality control, which is all based on how much do your do your um, parts vary. What, what type of uh, variability is there in the production process and you have to keep it small enough that it won't hurt anything. Um, of course, the other examples they give are medicine. We cer certainly don't want the medicine to be too far off of what the dosage is supposed to be. So if it says it's three milligrams, you don't want it to have three and a half milligrams. Uh, you know, it might be okay if it's 3.03 .03 milligrams down to 2.97 milligrams, but you want to keep it within reason depending on the, the medication. Um, so let's look at what these look like. So what we're going to what we're going to be looking at are called chi-square distributions. Um, the chi-square variable is similar to the t variable in that you get different values based on the sample size. So you're going to have uh, degrees of freedom in this. Um, we use that uh, Greek letter. It looks kind of like an X, but it's pronounced chi. And one interesting thing about chi-square um, is it cannot be negative. And so instead of being all symmetric like a T um, curve or a Z curve, it gets, it, it's actually skewed to the right and you don't ever get any negatives. So here's some big pictures of some chi-square distributions depending on what the degrees of freedom are. So there's degrees of freedom 1, degrees of freedom 15, and a couple in between. So if you have a really low degree of freedom, it makes the uh, chi-square distribution really steep and tall. But the, the bigger that degrees of freedom gets, it actually starts to look more like a, um, a normal curve. I mean, it's really not a normal curve, but it starts to look more like a normal curve than like this blue one and this orange one do. Um, it's still always skewed to the right a little bit. Um, and so, of course, to get these values, we're just going to look on the table. It's not anything you have to be able to calculate or anything. You just have to know how to look it up on the table. Um, the one thing about the chi-squared values is um, we don't have an easy chart like we do with the Z's and the T's where we can just look up the percentage and um, it's there. Um, with the chi-squared, you have a chi-squared right value and you have a chi-squared left value. And you also have to look up the, um, you have to split the percentage yourself um, depending on the problem. So kind of like we did when we saw the harder way to get the Z values off the chart, you have to take the percentage that they give you and you have to put that in the middle and then split the leftovers. So <clears throat> on this first one it says, let's use the, it just tells us which column to use. So it says, let's use the 95 and the 0.05 columns in the chart with 24 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to add to that a little bit. So if they said we were doing 95 and 0.05, then that means the original problem said that we wanted um, 90%. Um, and it said that uh, it said we wanted 90% and for confidence level. And when you have 90%, that means, well, I drew a normal, hold on a second, draw, draw a chi-squared. So when you have 90% that you're trying to do, we're still saying I want the 90% to be here in the middle. So I want from here to here to be 90%. And that leaves us 10% um, total, and that puts 5% here and 5% here. So what we're looking for, and they actually go backwards, um, instead of going, it doesn't start at zero and goes up, it actually goes this way. So we're looking up the 0.95, because I've got 90%, and then I'm 5 back from that, 5% back from that, so I'm going to be looking up 95. But you've always got two values with chi-squared, so you've got 95 and you've got 0.05. So if you come over here to the chart, um, you'll notice... I'm going to put a little mark here. 
there's one, two, three, four, five over here, and then one, two, three, four, five over here, and they kind of match up. Like this 90% goes with this 0.1%. So whenever you're looking up left and right chi-squared, you're looking up 0.90 and 0.10 would always go together. Now, if you go out one more row than that, for this problem, we said we wanted 0.95. So if we're going to go to 0.95, which is 2 from the middle, 2 to the left, then I've got to go 2 out on the right and do 0.05. These two have to add up to 100, just like p hat and q hat do. And so um, it'll always be those together. Um, let me get some different colors. So um, if I was going to do 0.975, then I'm going to do 0.025. If I'm going to use um, 0.99, let me get a different color here. If I'm going to do 0.99, then I'm going to do 0.01. Those are, those are going to go together. <clears throat> and then last but not least, if I wanted to do 0.995, that would be with 0.005. So one out goes together, two out goes together, three out goes together, and so on. So in this case, they would have told us 90%, and 90% would have meant we looked up 95 and 0.05. One trick for this is almost always, if you take what they say and you just go out one more. So they gave us 90, so you go out to 95. And then the matching is 0.05. So almost always you just take whatever they, they did and you, you go out, you pop out one more column on each side. So I'll show you that a little bit more when we're, when we're doing an actual problem. But then you come down to your degrees of freedom. In this case, they wanted 24. So 95 and 5 with a 24 degrees of freedom gives us a, a right chi-square of 36.415 and a left chi-square of 13.848. And then the other thing in this problem is it says the degrees of freedom are 24. Um, if we had a degrees of freedom of 24, then that means our n was 25. So they'll ha they have to give you this n. So on this next page, it shows what this, you know, when you would have been looking this up. So if you would have been looking that up in the chart, they would have said, find the chi-squared right and the chi-squared left for a 90% confidence interval with an n of 25. And again, the 90% got us actually 95, which goes along with 5, and then the n equal 25 means our degrees of freedom are 24. And so here's our formulas for the confidence intervals, because it could either be variance or standard deviation, depending on what, what the problem asks for. Um, if it asks for just variance, you don't have to do the square root. If it asks for standard deviation, then you have to do um, the square root on both sides. So you have to do the square root here and the square root here. Okay. But the numbers that you plug in, these are actually pretty quick to calculate. The, the hardest thing about this is the, cha the table changes. But the n minus 1 is just, um, you know, 1 less than your sample. S squared is going to be given to you. You're going to be given either the variance or the standard deviation in the problem. And then you're going to look up chi-squared right and chi-squared left on the table. So let's give this a shot and see what it looks like in practice. So we've got... Um, in this problem, it says find the 95% confidence interval for the variance and standard deviation, so it wants us to find both of them, of the nicotine content of cigarettes manufactured if a sample of 20 cigarettes has a standard deviation of 1.6. So let's start writing everything down. So 95% confidence interval. So we're going to get our, um, our chi-squared um, left and our chi-squared right from that. Okay, and I'll hold off on those for just a second, um, get this other stuff written down. Um, a sample of 20 cigarettes means N is 20, and they had a standard deviation of 1.6. Now be very careful about whether they give you standard deviation or variance. Standard deviation is not squared, so standard deviation is just sigma. Sometimes they'll give you variance, which is sigma squared, but in this case standard deviation is 1.6. So we're going to go to the chart, and remember we're looking for the chi-squared left and right of 95%. So 
So on the chart, the chart is past the one we've been using. <clears throat> and because they said 95%, like I said, my little trick is don't worry about really the subtracting anything. Anytime they give it, you really could just most of the time go out one more column than what they had. So we're using this 0.975 column, and then we have to go to the other side. This is the center, so I went out 3, and I'm going to go out 3 over here. So I'm going to use 0.975 and 0.25. And our sample was 20, which means our degrees of freedom are 19. So I've got 0.975, I've got 19 degrees of freedom, and there's my, my value for my chi-squared left is 8.907. So let me move this over and we'll get it written down. So chi-squared left is 8.907. Now let's look at our chi-squared right. So on the chart, um, again, we're looking to match up with the 0.975. We're looking at the 0.025. Come down to 19 degree, uh, degrees of freedom, and we've got 32.852. Okay, so that's our chi-squared left, our chi-squared right, our n, and our sigma, and we're ready for the formula. So our formula was, let me get it, written here. Um, and I'll just write it for variance, and then we'll do the standard deviation off of that. So the variance is n minus 1 times s squared. Oh, actually, that's not a... That's not a sigma, that's an S because it's from the sample. Sorry about that. And then um, we're supposed to divide that by chi squared right. And then that's supposed to be less than the actual population standard or variance. And that's N minus 1 times S squared again. But on this side, we're going to do chi squared left. Now you notice when I wrote them down, the, the chi-squared left actually goes to the right side of the formula, and the chi-squared right actually goes to the left side of the formula, so that's really easy to get mixed up. It's not the end of the world if you do it. You'll just notice when you get done with your confidence interval that you have the big number on the left side and the small number on the right side, and just flip it around. It's no big deal. You don't have to recalculate anything. <clears throat> so n minus 1 would be um, 19. S squared, they only gave us S because they gave us the standard deviation, so we need to square that. So 1.6 squared, chi-squared right is the 32.852, and that's supposed to be less than sigma squared, is less than um, 19 times 1.6 squared over 8.907. And if we calculate that out, and this is, a, again, pretty quick calculation, so you just have to type in, um, you know, 19 times 1.6 squared divided by 32.852 and so on. Um, and this uh, left side comes out to be 1.5 in this case. And the right side comes out to be 5.5, approximately, and that's the rounded values. And so we can be 95% confident that the true variance for the nicotine content is between 1.5 grams and 5.5 grams. Then to do the um, standard deviation, all you have to do is do the square root of 1.5 and the um, square root of 5.5. And so we can be 95% confident that the standard deviation of the population is between 1.2 and um, 2.3 is what these come out to be. So there's our confidence interval for the variance. Here's our confidence interval for the standard deviation.
So this next problem, again, it gives raw data. I won't do that to you in the, in the homework problems or the test or anything. So we'll just kind of cheat and look ahead. Um, they had you actually calculate the, uh, the variance, but we don't need to do that. All we need to do is see that there's 10 items. So n is 10. And that um, the data, when you calculated it, had a variance of 16.9. The other thing that we needed to need to know is that we're doing a 90% confidence interval. So we'll go to we'll write all that down over here. So n is 10. S squared is 16.9 because it gave you the variance rather than the standard deviation. And then we're doing a 90% confidence level. So we're going to go and see what our chi squared value is. So 90%, we're going to go to the top row up here, 90% would be like 90 and 0 0.10. Remember, this is the center. <coughs> it's kind of easy to see because you got the big values on the right, and the, or the left and the small values on the right. You can kind of tell it switches. So since it said we want a 90% confidence interval, we're not going to look at 90. We're going to pop out one more column, and we're going to look at 95. And the one that goes with 95 is 0 0.05. So those are the two that we're going to do together. Let me highlight that. I think that'll be a little easier to see. Uh, where's that? There we go. Okay, so we're doing 0.95. That's not what I wanted you to do. Holy cow. Can you delete that? Try that again. So I just want to do 95. And... Um, 05 are the ones that go together. And then we're going to go down until we get to um, our degrees of freedom. It was 10 years, so we're going to do degrees of freedom since the n was 10, then our D, um, df is 9. So we're going to go over and our chi squared left will be 3.325. And our chi-squared right will be this 16.919. So let's get that written down. So chi-squared left is the left one on the chart. That's uh, 3.325. And then the chi-squared right is 16.919. And now we're ready to plug everything into the um, formula. And so we've got <clears throat> n minus 1 times s squared over chi squared right. And then that's less than the variance, which is less than 9.1 times s squared over chi squared left. So n minus 1 is 9. <clears throat> we do not have to square this 16.9 because that's already s squared. They already gave us the variance. They didn't give us the standard deviation, so I don't have to square it this time. It's just 16.9. And then our chi squared right is the 16.919. That's going to come out pretty close to 9 because 16.9 and 16.919 practically just cancel out. And then over here I've got 9. Um, s squared again is 16.9. I don't need to square it because it's already s squared. And then our chi squared left is 3.325. And when you calculate that out you get um, 8.99 for the left and 45.74 um, for the right. If I take the square root of both of those, I get um, about 3.0 for chi squared left, or yeah, for the um, standard deviation lower value, lower bounded, then the upper bound is 6.8. So if we read that properly, it would say, get the other slide here. So to read that out properly, we would say, 
you can be 95% confident that the standard deviation is between 3 and 6.8 for named swarms in a sample of 10 years. Um, and the one up above, it says you can be, I don't know why they, that's not right. It's 95% for both of them, or 90% for both of them. This is supposed to say 90%. I don't know, this is a mistake. So this is 90%. That's a typo. So you can be 90% confident that the true variance for the cost is between 15 and, it's not cost, it's named storms. All right, somebody messed this slide up when they changed it. That the true variance for the storms is between 15.0, oh, see that's wrong too. Holy cow, let's fix that. Between 8.99 and 45.74. Somebody changed this slide and never changed the wording on it. <clears throat> and then we could be 90% confident that the standard deviation um, of the number of named storms in a year is somewhere between 3 and 6.8. So that's it. Um, I'm going to do one really quick reminder. Remember that when you're doing these, the biggest thing is you have to figure out what kind of problem you're looking at. If it's a mean with sigma given, in other words, if they say it's it's the standard deviation of the population. That's when you use Z. If it says that it's the mean, but all you have is the S, they only give you the sample standard deviation, then you're going to use T. So sample, cute little sample, uses the cute little T student uh, chart that the guy made that he when he was working for the company. So it's just a, a little bit quirkier because we don't have the, the standard deviation of the population. When you get to a proportion, you go back to using Z, and then chi-squared, I'm sorry, not chi-squared, um, if you have a variance or standard deviation, then you're going to use the chi-squared chart. Remember, if you get stuck on anything, you can always come back and rewatch the video. It's going to be up. Um, indefinitely till the rest of the end of the semester now um, so you can come back and look at these things again I apologize I had to be gone um, for class but hopefully this will be um, good and well and sufficient for you guys to still be able to um, do your homework and um, you were able to pick up your test if you wanted to and I'll see you back at class